Well, good morning. How's everyone doing today? You ready to worship? All right. Hey, before we jump into worship through song, I got some announcements I would like to share with you. First of all, if you are new to Highland Heights, thanks for joining us this morning. We are glad you are here. In the back of the seat in front of you, you're going to see a card that has a QR code on it. If you scan that QR code, it's going to take you to a website that just has a few very simple questions that we ask just to get to know you a little bit better. But it also gives us the opportunity to reach out to you this week to find out about your experience here at Highland Heights this morning, but then also how we can help you moving forward in the days ahead, how we can get you connected here at Highland Heights. So if you'd fill that out for us sometime this morning during the service, we would be grateful for you doing that. Also want to share with you that we have some new members to Highland Heights. They have said this is where we want to plant roots and be involved and grow and help fulfill the mission here at Highland Heights. So yeah, let's go ahead and give them a hand this morning while their pictures are shown today. This is awesome. Great group of folks new to Highland Heights. We also want to share with you that if you are new to Highland Heights and maybe you're not a member and you, you know what, I'd like to find out about Highland Heights and be a part of what's happening here, what God is doing in and through Highland Heights. We have our next new members class. It's Saturday, April 22nd at 9 a.m. You're going to want to go to hhbc.net slash events, either on the website or you can use the app to, uh, to find out the, uh, the dates and the details there. Just go to the events uh, tab at the bottom to find out all the events for the new members class. Also, we are excited about hearing from our mission team that went to Southeast Asia here a couple weeks ago. We're going to be hearing from them a little bit more in the service uh, a little bit later, but I want to stop there and just say thank you for giving, uh, for allowing us to do what we do in reaching across the world in sharing the gospel in the uttermost parts of the earth. There's ways that you can give this morning. The box is at the doors. You can give online through the app. During the week, you can bring your offering, your tithes and offerings to the church, drop them off at the office, or you can mail them in, whatever works best for you. I uh, also want to share that this coming Friday night is the Women's Ministry Craft Night. All right, so ladies, it is not too late to sign up for this. You can still sign up this Friday night, the 21st at, I think it's at 6 p.m. Forgive me if I'm wrong there, ladies. A portion of the proceeds will actually go to help support our counseling center. So we're teaming up, the ladies are teaming up at the counseling center to help improve what we're doing there. So we encourage you, it's not too late to sign up. Go ahead and do that, hhbc.net slash, say it with me. <laughs> Thank you, all three of you. <laughs> I love it. Hey, that's going to be the theme of the morning, slash events. You got it. Hey, also, I uh, want to remind you, tonight at 6 p.m., we got a business meeting for our church family. If you're a member here at Highland Heights, be back tonight a little bit before 6. We start right at 6 uh, for our business meeting. And again, it, there are so many things happening here at Highland Heights. We don't have time to go over everything every Sunday morning. So we encourage you, if you don't have the app, hhbc.net slash our app, download the app and go to hhbc.net slash events. And you can see everything that's happening here at Highland Heights that you can register for, sign up for, and just be informed about. All right? Sound like a plan? Yeah. I love it. Hey, go ahead, stand up with me right now. Look to your neighbor square in the eye and say, hhbc.net slash events. Hey, welcome to church. Let's celebrate the Lord this morning.
But now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Come on, church. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty.
Amen. You may be seated, church. After service today, uh, Tim's going to be hosting a class teaching people how to clap and sway in time. And <laughs> it's going to be really good. No, we, we're so glad that we get to, to worship. Yeah, HHBC slash events. There you go. So you can sign up right now. Oh, man, we're so excited that you are here today. We do have some uh, special guests that are going to join me on stage. And Eddie, if you'll do me a favor as you're walking by, if you'll grab the mic that's down there. I forgot to grab that. And apparently can't hold on to my phone either. So y'all can come on up here. We are super passionate about sending people out in their everyday lives and around the world on mission. And today we have the awesome opportunity to hear from our Nepal team that got back uh, just a month ago. We're really just excited about what God is doing in South Asia. And so uh, looking forward to hearing their testimony about their experience while they were over there. I also wanna share with you, we're passionate about sending you out every single day over this past weekend. We had a team that went out prayer walking. You can find that hhbc.net slash events, Tim, just so you know. And we also had a team that worked through our food pantry to start the process of putting on a roof on a house that had been uh, uh, burnt by fire. And so we need to finish that up. Actually, Dave Mason's going to help out. If you have tomorrow free and you would like to help out with that roofing project, you can meet him right up front after service. But other than that, we're going to spend some time talking to you guys a little bit about what you experienced over in South Asia. So let me pull up my questions and we'll just start and you guys can pass around the mic. The, the first question I have is, is what led you to wanting to be a part of this trip to South Asia? Who, whoever wants to take the lead there. <laughs> yeah, so um, initially... Uh, I would say, was it last December, I think, is when we initially announced the trips. Um, I was planning on taking a different trip this, um, this year, actually one that would have uh, happened this past week, um, going to a songwriting conference. And um, when I was trying to get all the details and everything together, and when Pastor Josh announced that we were taking a trip over to Asia, um, I, I, the only way I can describe it was that I, I almost heard God's audible voice say, or you could go there instead. And it was in that moment I just went, okay. And I called, I called the other people hosting the trip and I said, hey, I'm out. I guess I'm going to Asia now. And they said, oh, really? And I said, yeah, um, God's telling me I need to go. <laughs> and that was how it happened. <laughs> yeah, God says go and we go, absolutely. Yeah. Anybody else just have a testimony about how God led them to go on this trip to South Asia? All right, we'll go to question number two. How about that? All right, so uh, just maybe uh, a couple of you can share just a brief description of what you did while you were over in South Asia. I know there were two different groups. Uh, you guys split up and were on opposite parts of this country. And so if maybe you guys can each share what you guys did while you were over in South Asia. Well, I don't know what, I mean, I know what the other group did, but I wasn't there, so I can't speak to that. But um, our group, we split up into two separate groups, um, and our group was able to go into more rural areas of the country and do just different like um, church events and holding church services and things like that. And so basically just encouraging the local believers that were there. So it was really cool and really encouraging to just see the way that these mm -hmm. people like worship and love the Lord and just serve him even in really rough situations. So it was, it was a good experience, I think. Our team, um, we're also missing a person, Alex. Um, we were in the city of this area and we were with some, a local couple that's there, um, an American couple that's lived there for a few years and they just really needed um, some people to come encourage them but also we went out every day with local Christians in that area that were more of like translators but they're also local people of the church there and um, in this country it's illegal to just go up to somebody and say, hey, can I tell you about Jesus or to try to convert somebody um, to Christianity? And so what that looked like for us was we would get together in the morning with the couple and with the local believers of and followers of Jesus and we'd pray and we'd, we'd go through the scriptures and um, then we would just hit the streets and, and you walk everywhere here. Um, there's no street signs or anything like that. So you're just walking and you're praying and you're um, letting the spirit lead and you would, that would look like us just walking and, and just seeing somebody and being like, 
hey, I, I love your outfit. Could you, could you tell me about that? Like, they would, want, they would love to because I'm a foreigner. Um, they'd love to tell me about what it means. Yeah. And, and then it would just go into conversations that would lead to, like, wow, you know, this religion is interesting here, or, or this religion is interesting here. What, what do you classify yourself as? Can you tell me about that? And then that would lead into conversations where then I could share, yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus. Have you ever heard of Jesus before? Mm-hmm. And do you know what that means? Can I share a little bit about that, what that means? And, and these people are so generous that they would invite you into their home they would feed you something. You never know what, um, <laughs> but it was good. And you don't ask. And you don't yeah, ask. you don't ask. No, we, but we, yeah. yeah, so we, you get invited into people's homes and then you just hear them. You listen to them and um, get to know them and then see an opportunity to tell the gospel story and the grand narrative to them. And yeah. then yeah. the couple and the local Christians are going to follow up with them. Like they're following up with these people. They're meeting again with these people. So it's not just a one done. It's they're meeting with these people regularly now. So it was really cool. Well, maybe a couple more of y'all can share a little bit. I know, again, two different sides of this country. How did you see God work while you were over in South Asia? Yeah, so one of the um, really cool things that it's happening over there um, is God's like healing people. People are coming to Christ, you know, through people getting healed. And so um, I had the privilege of playing with somebody to accept Christ. And what had happened was his son had gotten healed. You know, they didn't really have any money. He got diagnosed uh, with a really bad, you know, um, diagnosis or whatever. They didn't have any money, you know, so it was almost like we're going to lose our son. The, the mom was a believer, so they took the son to church. They prayed. God healed his son. You know, the dad's wrestling with this, like, what just happened, you know? <laughs> and uh, so we did the service at this one uh, church and then had lunch, and it was just time for him to come to Christ. And so he came to one of the pastors and said, uh, I'm ready, you know? And then the pastor came and got me and said, let's get the team in there and pray with them to accept Christ. And so it was super cool to see what God's doing over there and to see, you know, that people are coming to Christ like crazy. And... Um, you know, and then for him to heal his son and, and for him to come to Christ and get to take part of that was just like mm-hmm. such a blessing, you know. And then to know that he has that local church right there to plug into that's loved him. And, and uh, it's just super encouraging to see uh, the way that they represent Christ and follow him so well. Yeah. Anybody else? Just something you saw God do while you were on this trip? Yeah. So I think um, for anyone who's heard like what happened, I guess the answer would be like, how did God not move on this trip? Mm-hmm. with all of the yeah. obstacles that we faced along the way. Even, like, before we left um, Dulles, like, two hours before the flight, having to go get COVID tests and getting them done and the results back 15 minutes before the check-in gate closed. Just, like, everything was God. And, like, Satan was definitely working his hardest to make sure that we weren't the hands and feet of Jesus on this trip. But um, I think giving, having the opportunity to share with the churches like on our side, um, everything that happened and everything that God did to allow us to be there. Like one, it was encouraging to them that we were there because from their perspective, they were like, well, why would you fly across the country to come like encourage us? Um, And then two, to see how big our God is, um, just that he brought us there to visit them and to encourage their church. Yeah, anybody else have a story they want? All right. Yeah, so the group that we were with, like they were saying, we were with the Nepali or South Asia believers. And um, one of the things that we were kind of tasked with is a lot of the believers there don't necessarily know, not how to share their faith, but they just want to get more comfortable with doing it more often. And so one of the things I know me and Alex were doing is just helping them to, to be comfortable with doing that. and. Um, one of the ways that we did it was the hand gospel. And I don't know if y'all have done that before in sharing the gospel with people, but it's really easy and it takes like a minute and a half. And so we were kind of teaching them how to do that. Um, and then they would do it more often and more often. And then at the end of the trip, we just noticed that they were so much more more bold and courageous in doing that. And I saw a couple of the people that we were with the whole week just be bold and share the gospel with people on the street. And we just followed them. 
and it wasn't us going out and them just translating for us, but it was them doing the work because mm -hmm. that's their people and mm -hmm. they're people that they care about. And yeah, it's just an awesome thing to see whenever yeah. it was all said and done. So church family, just to kind of get paint a picture for you, I mean, no matter what part of the country you're in, um, this area of the world is like 0.67% evangelized. Um, and, and so if we don't go, uh, partner with the church there, um, normally they say at least 2% of believers is the beginning of a, of a tipping point, then, then you're going to see hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people that, that die having never heard the name Jesus. And so, I, you know, when we think about where God has called us as a church, we get the opportunity to step in and to partner with that is really incredible and cer certainly thankful for your team going. Uh, before you guys uh, step down, let me ask you this. Um, you know, this fall, we have another opportunity to go back into the part of the world in South Asia where, where you guys have, have just been. And uh, we actually have an interest meeting. So you're already here today. You can be a part of it right after church, about 15 minutes, just right here in the front. Would love for you to come and learn more about how you can be a part of that team that's going in September. What would you say to encourage our church member who might be teetering on the edge saying, I don't know, but I'm interested and maybe God's leading me in this direction. It was such an amazing trip and like I think we can all attest that we saw some really spiritually heavy things but also the most encouraging things ever and we really got to see firsthand that the gospel is the hope of the ages mm -hmm. and that Jesus is truly worth it all so yeah it was yeah. so incredible yeah. I would say to just really rely on the spirit because um, when it comes to these things like sure you know, we want to send everybody, but we can't send everybody and not everybody is being led by the spirit to go. Like we're all sh called to share the gospel, whether that's here, whether that's there, because just as much as there's lost people there, there's lost people here, but really just rely on the spirit, um, be in constant prayer and, and come today. Like there's nothing, no, it's not going to hurt just to come and to hear about it. But, um, yeah, there's a great need there. Obviously, you go, not just for a personal experience, but you go to meet the need um, in that area to, to share and for the encouragement of the local Christians there. And um, you just rely on the Spirit's leading, I would say. So church family, like I said at the very beginning, it is our passion to help mobilize our church to share the gospel and our community um, and also around the world. And so we want to be able to do that. If you are interested in going to South Asia with me, uh, we'll have that meeting right up here after service. And like I said, if you can swing a hammer and want to work on a roof, we'll have that meeting right after service too. We need three or four volunteers to come and do that tomorrow. And so we love being able to be a church that's passionate about missions here and everywhere else as well. Let's go ahead and pray. Um, and that God would continue to move in South Asia and we'll continue to worship this morning. Father God, we do thank you so much for what you're doing, what you're doing in this place, the spirit of joy that you've given us and the passion to get the gospel to the least and the lost, whether that's here or whether that's halfway around the world. We know, God, that you've called us to be the body of Christ, the church that lives on mission for you. So we pray that uh, throughout the morning that we would be stirred up in our hearts, more passionate about the gospel, more excited about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ to experience your grace and your truth and your peace and your joy in our lives. And we're excited to take that grace, that peace, that joy, and that truth to the world that is around us as well. We know that there are many pastors in South Asia that are pastoring churches uh, that are in great need and pastoring in context with great difficulty. And so we pray for our, past, our, our pastors and our brothers and sisters around the world, God, that you would empower their worship as they continue to seek you and that you would empower their boldness as they continue to live for you on mission as well. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you for what you're doing in your church here and around the world. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank y'all so much. Appreciate it. Church, we stand. Let's continue to worship this morning. Let's proclaim his goodness. Thank him for his love.
From the darkness I called your name Into darkness your mercy came You called me out, lifted me up How great is your love You bore my weakness, you took my shame Buried my burdens in fields of grace. You called me out, lifted me up. How great is your love. From the heights of heaven, you stepped down to earth. In a sin perfection, you gave your life.
Thank you for stepping down from heaven into this world to save us, to be the light in the darkness. Lord, open our hearts, open our minds. Lord, now as we receive your word, Lord, and teach us to be more like you. In Jesus' name. Man, we are excited about uh, what God is doing here at uh, Highland Heights. I hope that you are too. And I'm really excited to dive into uh, this letter that we are going to be in, written by the Apostle Paul uh, to a man who's living in Colossae at the time named Philemon. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, who some of these characters are and why this letter was written. But and I'm excited. It's a short letter. As a matter of fact, it's the shortest letter that the Apostle Paul wrote uh, throughout the entire New Testament. And, and there's not necessarily a lot to it lengthwise, and yet it packs this incredible power, dynamic punch to us who are struggling in life. And as we think about how the gospel should have changed us and empowers us to live. And so for the next four weeks, beginning this Sunday, beginning today, we're going to study this little letter called Philemon. And we're gonna find that I believe it has a dynamic implication for our lives. And so one of the things that I want to tell you as we're getting into the text this morning is that, see, this is one of three letters in the New Testament that is written specifically to individuals. We actually have First and Second Timothy, if you want to combine those two letters. And then we have the book of Titus written to, from Paul to Titus. And then we have this book called Philemon. Most of the books that we have that are written from the Apostle Paul are written from the Apostle Paul to churches that he has visited, churches that he helped to start in churches that he plans to visit in the future. But these, these shorter letters, these letters that are written to individuals, they give us this personalized glimpse, this individualized glimpse into how the gospel truly impacts our lives as believers in incredibly powerful ways. We recognize in a letter like Philemon that the gospel that changes our hearts, the gospel that makes us right with God the Father through faith in Jesus is a gospel that continues to satisfy our deepest longings. It's a gospel that frees us from the sin that so easily ensnares and traps us. It's a gospel that grows us in Christ's likeness that we might look more like our Savior, Jesus. And then it's a gospel that frees us to live more fully for Jesus in our everyday lives. So what is this little letter, this book called Philemon, this page that shows up that you might be tempted to just gloss over, glance at, move on from? What is this letter really about? Well, first off, we're going to say this, that this letter is written to a man who was named Philemon. It's who the letter is named after. And what you're going to find out about Philemon is he's a very well-off Roman citizen from the city Colossae. And he likely meets Paul as Paul's on one of his missionary journeys through Ephesus. And in Ephesus, as Philemon meets Paul, he becomes a follower of Jesus Christ himself. Then when Epaphras starts a church plant or a new church, Back in his hometown of Colossae, Philemon goes with them and he quickly becomes a leader in this new church. Here's just a really cool side note for us at Highland Heights. You won't want to miss next week 
because our very own church planner that we're going to be sending out next year, and hopefully some of you are going to be joining him as we plant a church, will be preaching next week's passage. But let's go ahead and get back to the text. So Philemon is this wealthy Roman citizen. And like most other wealthy Roman citizens of his day, Philemon owns slaves. Now, when we think about slavery in America, it's easy for us to think about slavery from an ethnic perspective. That wasn't necessarily the case in Rome, nor does that matter for making slavery right according to God. We need to understand both of those things are true. They aren't necessarily the things that Paul is going to address with Philemon specifically, and yet there are some things that Paul needs to address that do relate to slavery, but also has great implications for our lives today. So Philemon owns slaves as a wealthy Roman citizen, and one of those slaves we're going to find out in this book is named Onesimus. And so Onesimus and Philemon, they have a serious dispute. And it's likely because Onesimus has either cheated Philemon's business or he stole something from Philemon personally. And so Onesimus, out of fear, he flees from Philemon's household and he flees from the city. And if he's caught both as a thief And as a runaway slave, the sentence could be death. It's a pretty serious circumstance that we're riding into. So somewhere on the way, Onesimus having fleed from Philemon's household with a pocket full of change, realizes that the freedom that he thought he had gained was not the freedom that his heart truly most deeply needed and desired. So Onesimus seeks out Paul, the same apostle Paul who met Philemon in Ephesus, but who's now being held in prison. And he seeks out Paul while Paul's in prison so that he might help him restore his relationship with Philemon. So check out the irony in all of this setup. A man who is a slave escapes and is free in a worldly sense. He discovers the freedom gained is a freedom that is greatly lacking. And he turns to a man in prison, a man who isn't free in a worldly sense, but a man who knows freedom that defies chains. There's irony in what is going on in this passage. And while Paul and Onesimus are together, Onesimus becomes a follower of Jesus Christ too. And he becomes a great helper to Paul as Paul is in prison yet continues to minister and share the gospel even from his jail cell. And that's the backdrop of the book that we're diving into over the next several weeks. Here's what the text says. Let's read it together. The first three verses this morning. He says, Paul a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Not you, Rome. You didn't imprison me. I might be in chains sitting in your cell, but I'm a prisoner first and foremost of Jesus. And Timothy, one of those other guys, those other pastors that he wrote a letter to, is sitting beside him, our brother. To Philemon, our dear friend and coworker, Paul starts out with this praise and respect for Philemon who has sacrificed as a worker for the gospel. Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Really interesting because Paul's about to dig personal with Philemon. And he says, I'm writing to you specifically But by the way, Philemon, you can read this letter to the entire church so that they can hold you accountably, accountable personally as well. And then we get to this phrase that Paul uses so often as he's writing letters, whether it's personal letters to Timothy and Titus 
or church letters to, like Ephesians and Colossians, he says these words. And we're going to dig into these words this morning. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to repeat that verse with me this morning. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we come to our text this morning. We pray that as we review these words, that it won't just be something that we review for head knowledge, but that it will have life-changing implications for us personally, just as it had life-changing implications for Philemon, for Onesimus, and for the brotherhood between Paul and these now new believers. Father God, we do pray that you would use this word in our lives. Illuminate the text by your spirit that it would pierce our hearts and that we would live more fully for Jesus because of these words today. In your name we pray. All God's people said, amen. So today our, our, our verse that we're going to focus on is, is simply verse 3. It's grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and we're going to talk about the beginning with the meaning of grace and peace because Paul uses these words at the start of most of his letters. Think about this. Colossians chapter 1 verse 2. To the saints in Christ at Colossae who are faithful brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God our Father. It's interesting that Paul, who was a person who writes to the church in Colossae, the church which Philemon is a leader, opens up this personal letter with the same words that he pens to Philemon personally. Grace to you and peace from God our Father in Colossae. In Ephesians, where Philemon first comes to faith in Jesus Christ, chapter one, verse two, he says, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. To Timothy, who sits in prison with him in this moment while Timothy was pastoring a church in another location, and Paul writes to encourage Timothy. He says, to Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. And here's the thing that happens. It's so easy when we read these words, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we see them on repeat throughout all of Paul's letters to quickly brush by them without considering the weight that they had for Paul, the weight that they had for the initial reader of the scripture, and the weight that they carry for us as well. And here's the thing that I want to say to you as your pastor this morning. We would be entirely unwise to do so. Why does Paul constantly use these two words, grace and peace, grace and peace, grace and peace, in nearly every one of his letters? I'm going to tell you that it's because these are the words that have so been embedded on Paul's heart because of how God so radically changed his life, that he couldn't help but articulate, that he couldn't help but share, that he couldn't help but pen grace and peace, grace and peace over and over and over again, every single time he reached out to other followers of Jesus as well. Grace and peace embedded on Paul's heart. See, prior to becoming a follower of Jesus, Paul was a Pharisee, which means he was a part of the religious sect of Jews who really measured the entire worth of their life by doing all the right things, by knowing all the right things, by saying all the right things, because it was in doing and in knowing and in saying that this particular group of Jews thought that they could please God. It was in doing and knowing and saying that if they would just check all the religious boxes of the day, that they thought that they had eternal life. It was through religious rituals, adhering to the right religious formula. And it was through religious works, doing the right things that they thought they had God's favor. But for the apostle Paul, encountering Jesus changed all of that. He sees that the way to please God and to have everlasting life is receiving God's grace 
through faith. There's some in the room this morning that just don't get it. I don't care if your background is Catholic. I don't care if your background is Baptist. I don't care if your background is Methodist. I don't care if your background is Pentecostal. I don't care if your background is Hindu. I don't care if your background is Buddhist. I don't care if your background is Muslim. No matter what background you have, whether you grew up in another faith altogether or have grown up in this very church, it is easy to sometimes substitute in our minds that if I simply mentally assent to the right things, if I know the right things, if I simply can say the right phrases, I've prayed the right prayer, if I simply just do a few nice things, my good works outweigh my bad works, that that means I am right with God. And what grace does is it completely destroys that. It destroyed it for Paul. It destroys it for us as well. Because what the Bible actually teaches us is that our righteousness is as filthy rags before a holy God that we could never be right enough apart from his grace, his unmerited favor poured out for us. Don't miss this, grace is the opposite of works. Works will tell you that you have to be good enough to earn God's favor, but grace says you're never going to be good enough, but you can receive God's favor anyway. That's why we call it good news. You're never gonna be good enough, but you can receive God's favor anyway because Jesus was perfect for you. He died in your place. He took God's wrath for you. And then he rose from the grave as a declaration that sin, death, and hell are defeated for you. That's why Paul opens up this letter saying grace to you so that you can receive and live in God's grace. The second word that Paul uses all throughout his letters is this word peace. See, prior to becoming a follower of Jesus, Paul was one angry dude. Maybe some of you even identify with Paul in this area of your life. He took joy in punishing others who did not see, who he did not see as good enough, particularly those who were following Jesus. Check this out. He was chasing followers of Jesus down. He was throwing followers of Jesus in prison. He was even taking pleasure in overseeing followers of Jesus murdered in the streets. All of this is recorded in scripture for us. See, Paul might have been a good Jew in his mind, and he might have even greeted other Jews with the word shalom, which simply means peace. But peace was something that was out of reach for Paul. Peace was something that he didn't have in his life. He did not have peace with God. He did not have peace with others. Peace was elusive. But encountering Jesus changed all that too. Now this man who was so angry, now this man who was filled so much with hate is a man of peace. Check this out. Paul writes to the church in Rome and he says this, therefore, since we've been justified by faith in Jesus Christ, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now Paul, once having not had peace with God, has peace with God. What about peace with others? In that same letter to the church in Rome in verse, chapter 12, verse 18, he says, if possible, So far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Church family, I'm going to tell you that Paul opens his letter with grace and peace because in Jesus Christ, Paul received the grace and peace he so desperately needed and it absolutely changed. It completely wrecked his life in the best way possible. We see the meaning of peace a grace and peace. But we also see in this one verse, the source of grace and peace. He opens up the letter. He says, grace to you and peace, who? From God, our father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know that there's any scripture that is more definitive about our futile state of depravity and God's miraculous singular source of grace Then as Paul writes to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter two, I love that it's from that particular book in Ephesians chapter two, that it was in that particular place 
where Timothy pastors, where Philemon is saved, where he first meets Paul and first encounters Jesus Christ, where he first experiences God's grace and peace that Paul writes, and he says this, and you were dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you previously walked according to the ways of the world, according to the rulers of the power of the air and the spirit now working in the disobedient, We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath, as others were also. Here's what Paul opens up this letter with as he says, you were doomed. Whether you knew it or not was irrelevant. You're on the losing team. You were rebelling against God. You wanted nothing to do with him personally. Given a choice every single time, you'd have chosen to run away from him. Given a choice every single time, you'd have chosen the way of the world. You didn't deserve God's grace. You weren't even a person who necessarily wanted God's grace until the Spirit pricked your heart and life changed for you. He says this in verse four, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love for us made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses, you are saved by grace. He also raises us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages, he might display the immeasurable riches of what? His grace through his kindness to us in Jesus Christ. For you are saved by grace through faith and it's not of yourselves. In other words, Paul writing to the church in Ephesus, Paul writing grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ to Philemon in our passage this morning says you are saved by grace. It's God's gift to you. It's nothing that you could do. You couldn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You couldn't boast about it, but God gave it to you anyway. It was available through Jesus. He is the source of our grace. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Don't miss it, church, that God is the singular source of grace and peace. It is only in God the Father and through faith in the Son, Jesus Christ, that grace and peace can be found. I'll take it a step further. It's only through God the Father and through faith in Jesus Christ, that love can be found. Real love, everlasting love, agape love, unconditional love. It's only through God the Father and through the Son, Jesus Christ, that hope can be found. Hope for today, hope for tomorrow, and hope for all of eternity. It's only through God the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ, that joy can be found a satisfaction in our soul that is beyond our circumstances. And Paul knows all of these things to be true. We find as he opens up this passage with grace to you and peace from God, our Father, that he's not just talking about the means of grace. He's not just talking about the source of grace, but he's identifying our great need for God's grace and God's peace in our life. Think about what they are going through. There is grace and peace in spite of their circumstances. Onesimus is a slave. Is there much grace and peace in that? No. Onesimus is a thief. Is there grace and peace for him by the world standard? No. He was a runaway with nowhere to go. Is there grace and peace for Onesimus to find? In the world, no. Paul is a prisoner. He's a prisoner for sharing the gospel. Was there grace for him? Was there peace for him in a circumstance that was dire, where death might have been certain? The world would say no. But grace and peace were his in spite of circumstances because of what Jesus had done. Not just in spite of circumstances, but how about this one? In spite of conflict. There's this massive rift in the relationship between Philemon and Onesimus. It was a riff so great that if Onesimus was to return to Philemon and Philemon wanted to, according to Roman law, he had the right to execute him. 
And Paul says to Onesimus, I'm going to write Philemon a letter. And you go ahead and be the one to deliver it. All right, but it better be a really good letter. You know what I'm saying? There was a need for God to provide healing to the hurt and forgiveness to the wronged. That could only happen because of what Jesus had done for them. That can only happen because what Jesus has done for us. In the coming weeks, I want you not just to see the meaning of grace and peace, the source of grace and peace, Not just our great need for grace and peace, but what grace and peace ultimately leads to is a life that is set free by the power of the gospel. I want you to see the result of grace and peace. I'll give you four things that you'll see over the coming weeks. I believe that grace and peace frees us to walk in vibrant faith. Because of what Jesus has done for us, we can walk in vibrant, attractive Faith. Think about this. There was something about Paul's faith. There was something that Onesimus had remembered if he had encountered Paul. Or there was something about Paul that he had heard about from Philemon as he was a slave under him. There was simply something about Paul that Onesimus find, found irresistible. So much so that in the midst of his greatest moment of turmoil... He knew of no other place to run. Let me ask you this, church family. Does your faith look like that? That when people are maybe in their greatest moments of need in their life, they look at you and say, I don't have it, but that person does. And whatever they have, That's something I want. Faith just oozed out of Paul. Grace just oozed out of Paul. Peace just oozed out of Paul. And what we ought to be saying as a church, even as we read this letter, is I want that to ooze out of my life as well. Do we understand what it means for our, our hearts, our cups to overflow? with the grace and peace because of our encounter with Jesus Christ. It frees us to walk in vibrant faith. The second result of grace and peace is that it frees us to live with real hope. Here is the reality for us as believers that following Jesus does not, does not make life easy. There are churches out there that will lie to you There are churches out there that will tell you that if you will just follow Jesus, if you'll just check all the right boxes, if you'll just know the right things, say the right things, do the right things, that life will be easy. But that is not the teaching of Jesus. Jesus says, in this life, you will have trouble. I don't know about you, but trouble and easy don't normally go together in my life. There are times that are easy, but it's not when I'm in trouble. And when I'm in trouble, I don't really find life easy. In this world, you're going to have trouble. You'll have trials. You'll have tribulation. But Jesus then says to his followers, take heart, for I have overcome the world. So it's not grace and peace because everything is easy. It's grace and peace that frees us to live with real hope, even in dire and difficult circumstances, even when you're sentenced to death by your owner, even when you're sitting in prison. Because of what Jesus has done, you can be filled with great joy and grace and peace. The result of grace and peace is that it frees us to forgive deep hurt. Because we have received grace and peace from God the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ, we can be people who extend forgiveness and restoration, grace and peace to others who have hurt us even in significantly deep ways. Because God has forgiven us, 
we can extend grace and peace to others. And finally, I'll say this, grace and peace, the result of grace and peace, it frees us to share the good news. Because somebody extended grace and peace to us, we can be a people who proclaim grace and peace, whether it's in our community, whether it's with a hammer and a nail, fixing a roof like we did yesterday and we'll have the chance to do tomorrow, whether it's prayer walking and simply praying for people like we did yesterday and we'll have opportunities to do next month as well, whether it's through going to the other side of the world because the Spirit of God prompts me, go. We can do that because God has given grace and peace to us as well. Let me give you some ways to respond this morning. And we'll have some people that'll be up front. They would love to pray for you this morning, pray with you this morning, pray over you this morning, to extend grace and peace to you this morning. A couple ways to respond. This morning, maybe you're feeling a whole lot like Onesimus. You're not running from Philemon, but running from God. Looking to the outside world, for the grace and peace your heart so deeply desires. Maybe you even know about God's grace and peace, but you weren't, you weren't really sure that God's grace and peace was for you personally. Don't miss the good news at the beginning of Philemon. He says, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I just want you to turn to your neighbor this morning and say grace to you. In case there was any doubt, God's grace is for you. Not because of what you've done, not because of what you know, not because of what you've said, but because of what Jesus did on the cross and because the tomb is still empty. Grace is for you. And this morning, during our time of response, you have an opportunity to respond to God's great grace by inviting Jesus to come into your life and submitting your life to follow him. It is only through faith in Jesus that we experience the fullness of God's grace and peace in our lives. This morning, maybe you have experienced God's great grace and peace in your life, but you're not living in God's great grace and peace for your life. That fits us sometimes as followers of Jesus. We know God's grace and peace, but we're not living in God's grace and peace. And every time we crack open God's word, it's an opportunity to respond to God's grace and peace, afresh and anew for me. You know, the word of God says his mercy is new each morning. And Tim, we're about five afternoon, but I believe, I believe it's good in the afternoon too. You can respond to God's grace and peace that you so desperately need, regardless of the circumstance that you're facing, regardless of your situation, regardless of where you've been and what you have done, God's mercy, his grace and peace can be anew in your life. We'd love to pray with you if that's you this morning. Maybe you have experienced God's great grace and peace in your life in powerful ways, but you realize that God's great grace and peace isn't just meant to be lived in, but it's also meant to be lived out. And this morning, God is calling you to serve him in a specific way, to share him with a specific someone, or maybe even to surrender your life to ministry. I don't know how God's working in your life, but every day we have an opportunity to respond anew to God's grace and his peace. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you and we are so thankful. So thankful for your grace and your peace. That grace that Ephesians says you lavished upon us. Undeserving as we were, you intervened. It says, but God, because of his great love for me, not because I deserved it, but because he does extends his grace to me, calls me to know it, to live in it, to walk in it, 
and to share it. God, in the next few minutes as we respond, will you do a work in our lives? Will you fill us with your grace and peace? Because we know that it's in your grace and your peace that we have hope, we have life, and not just for today, but everlasting. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, let's stand, let's sing together, and let's respond to the Spirit's moving. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Father, we are so thankful for a fresh experience in your presence, experience with your grace and your peace. As your word says, you lavish upon your children. That word always catches my heart off guard. You lavish me with your grace. I never run out of it. I can never exhaust it. I'm always in desperate need of it. God, I wanna live in it. God, I wanna share it. Father, will you continue to work your grace in my life and our lives this morning? Father, we're thankful for the peace, peace that makes us right with God through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because he paid the penalty for my sin, I can be made right with the Father. Let that reminder, that thought, that promise, that truth, never lose its sense of wonder in my heart. That leads me to worship. Because you're worthy, God. You're so worthy. Father, we thank you for our church family. We thank you for what you're doing. We thank you that we get to gather together as the body to give you praise, honor, and glory. We thank you that what you're doing isn't contained in these walls, God, but it's going out to our community and to the nation around us. 
Jesus, we pray that it not be for our glory or our name, but that you would be lifted up in all that we do, in our lives, in our families, in our church, in our community, in our world, that along the way, you would continue to draw people to you. Jesus, we love you, and we thank you for worship this morning. In your name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, man, I'm excited to jump into Philemon. I don't know about you. A little book packs a punch, doesn't it? Hey, how cool would it be to have Paul write you a letter? Like, just how awesome would that be? I'm just going through it, I'm like, man, that's phenomenal, Philemon. What, what an opportunity. Anyway, hey, before we leave this morning, we have got a new verse for this series. And it is uh, coming from the book of Acts. No, I'm just kidding. Philemon. Let's throw that, uh, that verse up there for us. Here we go, Philemon 1, 4, and 5. Let's say it all together. I always thank my God when I mention you in my prayers because I hear of your love for all the saints and the faith that you have in Lord Jesus. Amen, church. Hey, go live on mission this week. We'll see you next Sunday. <laughs>